introduce Milan Maximovic. He is um, uh, working in Paris and uh, did also his PhD in 95 at the University of Paris. Has then uh, had various postdocs in, at, in Paris, but also at ESTEC. Um, that brings us, of course, in connection with um, space missions. And indeed, he is uh, one of the uh, people working on uh, back then Ulysses to some extent, but of course now with uh, Parker Solar Probe and uh, Solar Orbiter. So uh, we are really at the heart of, uh, of, of, of the topic of uh, solar wind, which is uh, one of the big topics that he will address. So he will talk about the question and address the question, which theoretical approach um, is better to explain the solar wind expansion, fluid or kinetic? And your microphone is working. We already know that there is a, a link between the solar corona, which is hot more than 1 million Kelvin on the left hand side that you see during an eclipse. And uh, for instance, the, the northern light that we, we see in this country uh, very easily during winter. Uh, this, this thing has been known for, uh, for a very long time, that there was a corpuscular escape of particles from the sun. It was not clear at which speed. It was not clear if this escape was due, some theories were talking about the motion of the Earth into the solar uh, uh, corona. Uh, so the, all this was not clear, and it is actually, we can pay, uh, give credit to, to Biermann, which was a, who was a, a German astronomer, and who showed first that, as uh, was introduced by, by Jan Eric, that the, the comets have two tails. There you have a dust tail, which is due to the photons, which hit the which hit the, uh, the, 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 the nucleus and pro produce uh, dust tails. And you have a second tail, which is the plasma tail. And it is by looking at the plasma tail and uh, looking at blobs of the plasma tail that uh, Biermann uh, realized that there was a flow from the sun uh, coming at speeds around a few hundred kilometers per second. And we, when we look at the Parker paper, the introduction, he refers already to, to Biermann. OK, so this has al already been shown. This is a saw. Uh, uh, this is uh, several images taken in 2003, and it shows really nicely the, the, the evaporation of the, of the corona uh, to create a sol solar wind, which is mostly uh, hydrogen ionized, uh, hydrogen electrons and protons, with speeds from 2 to 800 kilometers per second at the, s at the Earth's orbit, with a lot of variations. You have the time it takes to, from the plasma to reach the, the Earth's orbit a density of 10 particles per cubic centimeter and a temperature at uh, 1 AU of 10 to the 5. So you have seen here on this picture at some point some, uh, some accident in the pictures. This is due to the fact that the sun, sun is also accelerating uh, energetic particles which can uh, encounter the, the spacecraft. OK, so let's go back to the first idea. And this is also classical and known in all books. I will go very rapidly. You have the Chapman hydrostatic uh, corona. This is just before Parker. So this is based on the fact that you assume a static corona. So you, you assume here uh, uh, the hydrostatic equilibrium. The gradient of pressure is related to the gravity. And you can uh, obtain easily this, uh, this uh, form, which is an exponential form for the variation of the pressure. Uh, you can make a first assumption, which is that in this integral, the temperature is constant. This is easier. But you can also do, as did uh, Chapman, a little bit more uh, uh, elaborated to assume uh, a specific relationship for the heat flux here, which is the heat flux proportional to, to t to the power of five uh, half. And this gives you a radial uh, profile for the temperature. And if you put the, this radial profile, you end up with this expression here for the pressure. If you try to look at what happens at infinity, what's the pressure at infinity? These terms uh, here vanishes, and you have the, this expression with the, the, the classical uh, scale height. The, this is the uh, temperature scale height in the, in, the, in the corona. And if you put real numbers, you end up, and we all know that, with the fact that the, the pressure at infinity is larger than the interstellar pressure by something like three orders of ma magnitude. So the static corona of Chapman doesn't work. It has to escape. 
And it was Parker who first uh, proposed that. So this is the paper which already has been uh, 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 introduced by Jan Eric in 58. I think, I'm no, I think uh, okay, maybe people know, but, uh, but I, my feeling is that really the term solar wind was first introduced by Parker himself. Uh, I don't know if it is in this paper or, or, or somewhere else. Uh, so the Parker model is, uh, is simply, uh, you have an equation, an equation of motion, we have these three equations, the equation of motion, which is uh, the Navier-Stokes e equation or the derivative of the Bernoulli equation uh, here, which is uh, relating the speed to the gradient of pressure and the gravity. You have a conservation of mass flux uh, equation, and you have a polytropic relation for the pressure and the density, with here gamma equal 5 third, which is adiabatic, and gamma equal 1 for the isothermal case. So the sol solar wind itself is in between the isothermal and adiabatic. This is already an open question. It's not adiabatic, because actually if you, if you put adiabatic in these equations, you do not have wind. Uh, so, what Parker has done, he, he has solved this equation by uh, assuming the isothermal case. And in this uh, case, the speed can be obtained by this uh, very classical equation that it is well known from all students in our field, where uh, at a given critical point here, which is the Parker sonic point, which has this expression here, with the sound spin being this expression here, you have the speed here, which can go over uh, the sonic point. And here are the equations. Here are, sorry, the, the solutions for this Parker uh, isothermal wind. So you have the supersonic solution, all these solutions. So this is uh, the, the speed in kilometers per second. The dashed line here is the sound speed in the medium because of the, uh, of the variation here of the, of the density. And here you have uh, the sonic point where uh, actually the, 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 the wind is becoming supersonic for the transonic solution. So you have three kinds of solutions. You have the supersonic solution, the breeze, you have the accretion solution, and you have the transonic solution. And the transonic solution, this is discussed in the, in the paper, is the real one. It's the only uh, plausible solution because it gives the right pressure at infinity it is the pressure which is not bounded uh, by the interstellar medium. So the solution is, is because given the value of the interstellar medium uh, pressure, uh, the solar wind itself is uh, choosing this transonic solution. Here, for different variations here of the temperature in the corona, you have uh, different variations here of the uh, distance of the sonic point between typically 3 to 12 uh, solar IDI. Uh, this was the prediction, a supersonic wind of a given uh, uh, velocity. And the first observation came just uh, really a few la years later uh, after Parker's model. Uh, really, I think that the, the paper and the model itself uh, triggered many, many studies, but many also uh, space investigations. So it was the Soviet first who measured the supersonic solar wind with the Luna 1 uh, probe in 59. Then they did that in sev with several probes. Of course, you need to go to escape the, the terrestrial uh, uh, magnetosphere in order to see the supersonic wind, for sure. So you need to go away. But really, the first very accurate measurement were, will, were done by Marcia Neugebauer and collaborators with Mariner 2, which was going to, toward the Mercury. And here you have the data. So this is data in Carrington rotations. But this is, you see, you have the, the date. You have the speed here. And you have the density of the protons. And you already see in 62 the, the, the nice anti-correlation between the speed and the density. Uh, fast wind, which is less dense than the slow one. Uh, and you see the variations of the wind. And the wind was uh, seen to be, uh, to be supersonic. And really, I think this was really the the start of Parker's career uh, after this prediction. So is the wind really a fluid? So I'm speaking about kinetic exospheric models. To look at that, so for people who are not uh, very familiar with plasma, just to remind you that you can compute the mean free path of uh, 
in the plasma. Uh, the minimum distance here approach air of these uh, two electrons, for instance. You define air by saying, uh, at the minimum approach, the Coulomb potential energy equals the kinetic energy of the particles. And this end up with the, you end up with a cross-section here, which is proportional to the speed of the particles to the power minus 4 here. So you can see that the mean free part, which is the inverse of the cross-section, the mean free part in a plasma is a very strong function of the, of the particle speed. Uh, it's not like in fluid uh, or in neutral gases, where the mean free part is a constant, whatever is the speed. Here you have a, a mean free part, which is a very strong function of the speed. And if you look at the, if you compute the mean free part, actually, the definition is for, for the thermal particle, you end up with the mean free path, which is equal to t squared over L. And if you put here numbers there, you have this, uh, this number here in uh, international units. And what is interesting to do is to compare the mean free path to the typical uh, macroscopic scales of the system. For instance, to the scale height. So either the, the temperature scale height or the density scale height. This is the density scale height. If you do that, you define the Knudsen number, which is the ratio between the two. And you have two regimes. You have a regime where the Knudsen number is much smaller than one, which is a fluid regime. This is what's happening in the corona, low uh, in the corona. Really, the MHD equations are completely valid, and no problem with that. When it is the opposite, when the Knudsen number is very large to compare to one, then the medium is collisionless, and it's hard to apply the uh, purely fluid or MHD approach. Of course, there, is, there are other uh, than effects than the Coulomb collisions. You have the collective effects and with the waves, which can then bring the, the, the medium toward uh, something which looks like a uh, fluid. But um, this is usually how we classify the theories. And the solar wind, so here are some data, the distance from the surface of the sun, the temperature in million Kelvin, the density here. So these are some, uh, some measurements in the corona uh, during eclipses. Uh, with bro, these are so measured. This is an old plot that I did a long time ago. This is the temperature from Ulysses. These are densities. I, if you take all these observations from uh, the very, very close to the, to the surface, to the photosphere, this is the transition region at 2,000 kilometers where the temperature rises to 1 million Kelvin. So if you put the numbers here and you compute using this formula, the Knudsen number, here, it, here is what you obtain. So this is the Knudsen number. This is the same distance from the sun. Here, this is 10 to the minus 5, 15, if you cannot see from the back of the room. This is 10 to the 5. The first point is that you have between the chromosphere and the very, very uh, close to the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona, something like 15 orders of magnitude in this number. It's, it's a huge variation. And the second point is that the solar wind and the corona themselves, they, they have a Knudsen number of about one. So it's ne neither completely collisionless nor completely fluid. It's in between the two. And really, the nature of the solar wind is, uh, is interesting because you can use the two approaches for, uh, to solve it. And at the end, as I will show, the two approaches are completely equivalent. OK, so there was a long list of other solar wind models, other than the Parker model or the fluid model, the, the, the so-called exospheric or, uh, or kinetic models, which are nothing else than the models for people who are looking at planetary atmospheres. You have the escape genes. This is what I said. You look at the number of particles which have a speed larger than the escape speed, and you compute the integral of that, and you have a flux, a density, and so on. So these are very similar models. So here are the a series of them. Basically, these models, uh, they solve the stationary uh, form of the Vlasov equation or the, the Liouville theorem. You have non-collisional particles moving in a uh, gravitational field, electric field. And there is an electric field. Why there is an electric field? And this is really the beauty of these models, is that they put the finger on the, really the, the trigger of the solar wind. You have an electric field because, basically, the protons and electrons, they don't have the same mass. So you start by looking at the electric field in the static uh, uh, regime. 
where you write the uh, hydrostatic equation for both the protons and the electrons, you end up with these pressures for the electrons and, and the protons. And they are basically the same. If the temperature are the same, which is basically what happens in the corona, you see that here, right away, because of the difference of mass between the protons and the electrons, you don't have the same scale height. If the temperature are the same, then the scale height of the electrons is much larger than the one of the protons. So the electrons, they try to escape. This is what I was saying at the beginning as an introduction. So the electrons try to escape the gravitational field. The protons, they are heavier. They try to follow. And, they, and there is a charge separation. There is an electric field, which is set in the plasma. This electric field then will push the protons. And you can compute in the static approach exactly this electric field. And by the way, this physics is the same as the one of the overall regions of the, of the Earth, uh, the polar wind from the Earth. I mean, you have very similar physics. Uh, this electric field, you put here an electric field, an extra electric field in this equation. And then you solve this equation by imposing the equality of the scale heights. And you, you end up with the, the ambipolar thermoelectric field, which is expressed here on the left hand side for the static case. It's basically nothing else than the gravity uh, times the mass of the protons here. So the Paneco Crossland, this was done by, pa by Paneco and Crossland in the, in the 20s. This uh, 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 hydrostatic electri electric field is the field which is needed to uh, impose the quasi-neutrality, or, or if you take and you solve the Poisson equation, it's the same thing. So these are some models which are uh, using this approach. These are some uh, very last models, or, or long, uh, long series of them, uh, by uh, Yanis Zuganelis and, and uh, uh, Lamy. Uh, in these models, we have used, they have used uh, a uh, non-thermal distribution function at the base of the corona. Uh, we observe such kind of distribution for the electrons in the solar wind. But the idea was to see what happens if we already impose them in the corona. So they, were, they used some uh, uh, kappa or uh, uh, Lorentzian uh, velocity distribution function for the, for the electrons. With the power low tail, so here you have the in this index kappa here in the distribution function shows the, how strong is the suprathermal tails. And these are various models for the electric field, for the bulk speed, as a function of this parameter kappa. So you can obtain both a large electric fields and large bulk speeds if you have large non-thermal electrons. And as in these models, the solar wind is triggered by the electrons, uh, if you, in, you, you have suprathermal tails for the electrons in the corona, then you can uh, have more electrons to escape and a larger electric field to push the protons. The important point here in these models, and this is actually why what I wanted to, to show, is that when you compute for the protons, uh, and th this is an interesting story, when you compute for the protons, the total uh, potential energy, which is the electric field plus the gravity, you see whatever is the value of kappa, and actually you can put a kappa here uh, close to 10, uh, 10 is already very close to Maxwellian, and kappa equal infinity is Maxwellian. Uh, whatever is here, the, 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 the value of the parameter, of course, you obtain a, a wind which is uh, slower at 1 IU, but you always obtain a maximum here for this electric field potential as a function of the distance. So this is the, this, this total potential. Uh, expressed in unity of uh, k t0 uh, at the base of the corona. And actually, you have the same in Parker's model. So there was a long debate between the people who are uh, the aficionados of exospheric models versus the, the fluid people uh, about uh, is it the same, uh, what's the difference. And something like uh, it was in 2009, I, w I had the privilege to organize this conference, the Solar Wind uh, Conference number uh, 12. It was done in, uh, in Saint Malo, in, uh, in Brittany. And, and I was happy because uh, Jean came to the conference and gave this very, very good uh, talk where he actually showed that there is an electric field in his model too. So the electric field in Parker's model, 
if you assume you take the Parker equation, equality of uh, uh, the temperature of the electrons and protons, and you assume basically uh, massless electrons. So this is the Parker equation. Then you can compute the electric field for, again, from the gradient of pressure here. And then you can have an explicit form of the electric field in this form here, which is quite simple. Let's assume that there is no V. You have a static corona, no motion. So you put V zero e equals zero here. You end up exactly with the panicle Rosland solution, which is exactly the same as the one you obtained by using an exo exospheric approach. It's quite interesting. And then if there is no static corona, if there is a wind, so V different to zero, then the electric field is the panico crossland plus an extra term, which is this term here, which is MP over E, V dV over the air, which is the additional electric field that you have in any case in the system, even with the fluid approach, which is uh, the same as in exospheric models. People, the very first exospheric models was done with the panico crossland field. It was the Chamberlain, and he ended up with the breeze, exactly the same. If you do correctly and you impose not only quasi-neutrality but also equality of the fluxes in the exospheric models, you obtain an extra electric field. And uh, this field is necessary. This is written from the Parker uh, paper from uh, SolarWind 12. Necessary to confine the outflow of electrons to the slow moving ions by pulling down on the electrons and by pulling up the ions and accelerating them. So, not only you have an electric field, but it has a very, very similar form. Let's go back to the transonic solution and the supersonic and so on. So here, let's take these are isothermal solutions of Parker. Let's compute the electric field by taking the gradient of the pressure. So you see that the families, they are a little bit modified, but you have uh, all the different the transonic solution and so on for the electric field. And you have uh, the supersonic one, which is there. What happens if you take, if you compute the famous uh, uh, potential, which is the electric potential minus the gravity, you end up with exactly the same as the transonic Parker model. You see, as the, sorry, the, the transonic exospheric solution. You have here in black the supersonic solution of Parker, which is here. And you end up here with the maximum there is always a maximum of uh, potential electric plus gravity for the protons close to the sonic point. It, this is an important point. There have, there have been papers in the literature about that. There is a paper by Jack Scudder who claims that this is exactly at the sonic point. This is not the case. It's not correct. It's a little bit after the sonic point here. And uh, so this is very, uh, a very interesting point, and there is still some work to be done there. What about measuring this electric field? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to have uh, this kind of measures. You know that we can measure the electric fields on uh, Parker Solar Probe, on uh, Solar Orbiter. We have an, an instrument for that. I think that on a juice also you will be able to measure the, the electric field by looking at the difference of potential between two probes. You have difference of potential. You divide by, the, by an effective length, and you end up with an electric field. The measurements are not easy, but in any case, it's not worth doing that. This is the, the potential in exospheric solution as a function of distance. If you a compute the electric field in millivolt per meter here, you see the numbers. So the best we can do, uh, Yuri is, uh, uh, is measuring that in the solar wind using a solar orbiter. I don't know how much you can have. I mean. A few maybe millivolts per meter, or maybe, uh, but I'm not sure that you can get something like 10 to the 4 or 10 to the minus 3 uh, millivolts per meter in the solar wind. This is very difficult. So we cannot measure this, but we can see the effects of this ambipolar electric field, which is accelerating the, the protons. So for that, let's go back again to the purely exospheric kinetic approach. This is very simple. Uh, you take here, the equation of conservation for uh, the energy of all the, all the species. Let's concentrate on the electrons. The, you neglect the gravity for the electrons. So you have that. 
For the electrons, of course, uh, at infinity, the speed, uh, if you look at what is the speed at infinity, uh, sorry, if you impose the speed at infinity to be zero, then you, you can compute the, the equivalent of the escape speed for the electrons in the corona. So at infinity, this, if this is equal to zero and this equal to zero, you have this simple equation. So this is the value given the electric field of the escape speed at, at the corona. So what's happening? The electron distribution function in the corona should be this one with the truncature. Why a truncature? Simply because in the corona, the, all the particles which have a positive speed, they are all leaving the corona. Some of them will have a speed which is larger than the local escape speed and they will never come back. So you have a void here in the velocity distribution function. These particles are the ones which contribute to, the, to basically the solar wind. They are reaching the infinity. And those are the ballistic particles which go and come down and they have the speed which is smaller than the escape speed. So this is the picture of the distribution function in the corona. And this is the picture of the distribution function at one astronomical unit where you have the flux has decreased, but you have also the value of the electric field which has changed here. And you have this truncature which is closer to, uh, to this here zero. And the escape speed here uh, is kind of smaller because the potential at one AU is smaller. And here is uh, actually the, the what the distribution function looks like. So if there is an electric field in a simple picture, there should be a kind of truncature on the velocity distribution for the, for the electrons, for instance. The same should occur for the protons. It's a little bit more complicated because you have this uh, potential which is non-monotonic and you have a maximum of potential for the protons. Of course, this is, this is the ideal world where you have absolutely no collision. And, and as I showed, the solar wind is not completely collisionless. There are still collisions. The core of the distribution is collisional. You have, of course, waves. This is unstable. So you have something like that. You will have a waves instabilities. You have magnetic fluctuations and turbulence in the solar wind. The particles, they don't follow uh, uh, magnetic field lines which are uh, 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 in a straight direction. Uh, so, of course, nature is much more complicated, but, and this was one of the, when we wrote the proposal for fields uh, with Stuart Bale and also with Justin Casper for the instruments, the remnants of the, of this ambipolar uh, acceleration, this was uh, one of the topic in the, the proposal. So do we see something? The answer is yes. So here you have distribution functions from the electrons obtained by the Parker Solar Probe. So Nikki Fox will show some more data. So it's not as it's not a truncature as 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 strict because of course you have collisions and you have and things which are smoothed. But here this is the anti-sunward direction. So this is the direction of the this to the right is the direction to the sun and the anti-sunward direction. This is an observation from the distribution functions at something like, uh, I think this is 15 solar ADI. This is the pitch angle, so the, the electrons which are, have a pitch angle of zero, they go back to the sun, 180 degrees, they are uh, along the magnetic field line and, and they are escaping. So these are all the escaping particles and these are the particles co coming back to the sun. And you see here, at some point here, you have a truncature. It's not completely Maxwellian. So this is Maxwellian here due to the core. At f larger distances, it's not Maxwellian. Or, uh, I mean, there is not, unfortunately, it's not easy to build an instrument with a large energy coverage in order to have all the energies for the solar wind electrons. Uh, you need a solid state detector and so on. Uh, but at least in this uh, energy range, clearly we see a, a, a cutoff. You can get the cutoff by computing the ratio to the core fit here as a function of velocity. So you see usually all the, all the pitch angles, which are, these are various pitch angles, all the pitch angles which are not, uh, uh, which are in the anti-solar uh, direction here, they have a ratio which starts to increase. And all the, most of the pitch angles here in the anti-sunward, uh, in the sunward direction, sorry, the ratio here, is occurring at something like some here two, two times the thermal speed. And you have the cutoff, which is, uh, which is visible there. So this is a very interesting paper by uh, Jasper Alekas. 
There is another interesting paper by uh, a student of, my, uh, of mine, Laura Bercic, who did also uh, analyze the data uh, from, uh, from Jasper Alekas, and she did also her own analysis of the cutoff. So this is the electric field that you get from the cutoff. Here, this is the electric field and the potential. And what she has computed is what would be the speed from, these are the observed speed, and this is the, the speed that you obtain from the cutoff. You do not accelerate completely. You, the electric field does not account completely for the acceleration of the, of the observed solar wind. Uh, there is some still, uh, possibly some other mechanisms which, uh, which uh, uh, actu the actual electric field that you, you get from the, from the electron distribution do not accelerate completely. There is probably a part of the electric field which is still hidden in some other part than the electron distribution function. Uh, possibly waves also can create an electric field which, is, which has to be uh, synchronized uh, in order to accelerate properly the proton. But still, the theory here uh, is not working so bad to explain uh, a part, at least something like 60 or 70 percent of the acceleration from the data. Okay, so final remarks. So Gene Parker's uh, early career coin coincide with the beginning of the space age, really. I mean, Nikki will show that. That uh, I think that his work has really triggered uh, the, the previously called the solar probe mission. Uh, it has uh, triggered and, and created a craze for many space scientists. It has influenced space agencies, for sure, NASA, ESA, Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter. These two missions are really great, and I hope we are going to learn a lot. We are seeing with, uh, there will be a press release soon, with Solar Orbiter and the imaging as you go close to the sun. So there is no uh, images on, on Parker Solar Probe because you are too close to the sun. But on Solar Orbiter, we have a heat shield, and there are some holes, not too big, otherwise you, you burn the, the payload. And there are some holes, and you can make images. And there will be a, a press release soon of uh, EU, EUI images, which are really, really amazing. Uh, plenty of uh, uh, brightenings. People are trying to look at, uh, at, uh, at nano flares or micro flares, nano flares on the surface of the sun, maybe to hit the corona. This was one of the propositions also by Jim Parker. So his work has really triggered uh, a lot of activities. Uh, he gave his name to many theories, as we, we already know, and phenomena in space physics. And uh, just my, my talk was to show that his model is still relevant today. I mean, uh, his model, his approach is very similar to the exospheric approaches. And, and uh, there are still uh, some even analytical work to be done on the model uh, nowadays. And that's it. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Milan. <laughs> <laughs>